life is a little bit messy. Uh, I mean, teachers and students that are trying to do both virtual and in-person teaching, it's really messy for them right now, and it's difficult to untangle some of those things. You got parents who are dealing with work from home situations or working in office scenarios that are a little bit different or strange than what they're used to, and, and all the while, working with kids who might be working at home, doing school. We are in the midst of a messy political situation and season that's coming upon us. And we have the messiness of wearing masks, not wearing masks, and all the different views and controversies that surround that. Uh, it's just a difficult time. And today we want to ask ourselves, how do we find joy in the midst of this mess? How do we move forward with joy in the midst of a really difficult kind of tangled up sort of life. And so the passage we're going to look at today is going to answer three questions for us that I think will help us walk down that path and learn to fight for joy in the midst of this mess. The first one is, where does lasting joy come from? I was amazed this week as I was just reading articles and looking at different things about joy, how much confusion and how much just blurriness there is about where joy comes from. So we're going to start right there. Where does joy come from and where does lasting joy come from? The second thing we're going to look at is what steals our joy? So when you're going through a difficult season, what is it? Why can some people have joy in the midst of these challenges and other people seem to really lack joy? What steals it from us when we go through these messy times? And lastly, how do I maintain my joy in this mess? So where does lasting joy come from? What steals our joy? And how do I maintain my joy in my mess. So let's open our Bibles today to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to look at uh, four verses from verse 4 through 7, where Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to the church in Philippi, is going to answer these three questions for us. So Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. I'm just going to read them, and then we're going to walk through them uh, one by one answering these questions. Paul writes this, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The first thing we see here, and really the overarching principle in this passage, is Paul is calling us as believers to rejoice, or to have joy, to remember our joy. And he says this twice as a strong encouragement that no matter what we're facing, uh, we should find joy. And Paul knows that better than anyone. He was writing this letter from prison when he wrote it to the Philippian church. And one of the major themes of the book is joy. So Paul has obviously found this secret to how do I maintain my joy even in the midst of messy situations in my life? You see, as Christians, our joy and enjoyment of God is the very thing that makes our worship authentic and not hypocritical. You see, we can worship God out of duty, and a lot of people can do that. They just dutifully go through their process of offering their worship to God, but that really doesn't honor God. Until we learn to enjoy him, until our desires are satisfied him, in him, then our joy won't be expressed. And so a joyless worship is really not honoring to God at all. And we are called to be a people of rejoicing. Jonathan Edwards makes these uh, very interesting observations. I'm paraphrasing them to use language that's easy for us to kind of grab onto. But he says this about how God brings honor or glory to himself, how God reveals himself. He says he does it in two ways. One is he reveals himself to us, whether it be in his creation or special revelation like his word. That's one way God glorifies himself. He reveals himself to us. He wouldn't have to do that. So when you see a beautiful sunset or you look at a beautiful forest of trees or magnificent mountains or an ocean, whether you believe in God or not, you in some ways glorify God because you see a creation that he made. And that's one way that we bring honor or glory to him. But the second way is through our enjoyment or joy in his revelation of himself. 
You see, the person that just talks about God's glorious works, and that could be a scientist that's just describing the intricacies and amazing things of God's world, that doesn't glorify God in nearly the same way that the person who actually finds incredible joy in a God who reveals themselves, who is satisfied and has this emotional response to the beautiful truths that God reveals. That means that joy as a Christian is absolutely essential to our worship. If we don't have joy when we worship God, then we're really no different than someone who doesn't worship God because they experience and they understand what God has revealed about himself. Even though they may not believe in him and they may not find joy in him, they still experience that. And when we lack joy, we truly lack uh, satisfaction that only God can give. So let me pause here for a minute uh, to just clarify some confusion that I believe has crept into Christianity about this concept of joy and happiness and, and these things and what's correct and what's not correct and what's biblical and what's really just cultural. Here's two things I've seen that I think are really confusing. Even though I understand the point they're trying to, to make, I think there's a better, more biblical way to make it. Here's the first thing. Happiness is a feeling and it's based on circumstances. I hear a lot of people say that. Happiness is just a feeling, and it's based on circumstances. Therefore, it's not good. It's fleeting. It comes and goes, and we should be, you know, careful about pursuing happiness. And then we'll say joy is not a feeling, and it's not based on circumstances. Therefore, it's good. So we have these views that are, have really crept into Christianity, I hear, and even in things I read this week, a lot of people using that kind of language. The problem is, that's not how the Bible uses these terms. In fact, in Psalm 1, one of the more popular psalms, the first psalm in the Psalter, uh, the Psalter says, happy is the man who does not you know, walk in the path of scoffers or sit in the seat of scoffers, or you know, he goes on to say happy or blessed. Blessed is oftentimes how it's translated. Many translations use the word happy, and happy is actually a better translation because the word means uh, an, a, an emotional response to a divine blessing that's, co that's come into that person's life. So happy is a good word for it. Uh, the same thing is also used in the Beatitudes. When Jesus uses uh, the word blessed or happy is uh, in all the Beatitudes, that word means that same thing. It's an expression of happiness that comes from being in a place of divine favor. So blessed is a translation, but many translations use the word happy because that really communicates the emotion or the state of emotion that a person is in when their mindset is focused on the things of God. The other thing we see is that the Bible uses the word joy all the time to refer to an emotion or a feeling that we have in response to something in our lives or someone in our lives. So the biblical use of these words is really not consistent with how we are defining them. And my point is simply this. All joy and happiness is a response to some circumstances in our life. Let me say that again. All joy and happiness is a response to circumstances in our life. Our concern about happiness or joy should not be that they're tied to circumstances. Our concern should be what circumstances are they tied to? What are the circumstances that they're tied to? And this is so important as we go on this journey of pursuing joy or finding joy in our lives. You see, earthly joy and happiness are always based on temporal circumstances in this world. So you can have happiness that's not so good. You can have happiness that is good. You can have joy that's not so good. You can have joy that is good. It's really based on what circumstances are surfacing them. And when they're based on the temporal circumstances of this world, we have to realize that, that they're not stable. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong. It just means they're not stable. You can have tremendous happiness just from walking outside and experiencing a crisp, cool fall morning. I experience that happiness all the time. That's not wrong. In fact, that's a way of expressing our joy and worship of God if we tie that to him as the ultimate source. Now, if I put all my happiness onto the weather 
And anytime the weather changes, my whole attitude tanks. Now I have a problem because too much of my happiness or joy is tied to something that can so easily shift or change. So happiness and joy can be good or bad, but it's always tied to our circumstances. In fact, I want to ask you this. If you're thinking about this and you haven't anchored your joy or happiness into something that's long lasting uh, beyond this earth, is, is there any joy in your life? Just ponder this for a moment. Is there any joy in your life that could not possibly be taken from you by the end of this year? Think about that. Think about all the things that you've anchored your joy in. Could any of them, is there any of them that are absolutely impossible to be taken from you by the end of this year? Is it a, a relationship? Is it a financial situation? Is it some other circumstance, a, a possession that you have? Is it possible to be taken from you, even in strange circumstances, by the end of this year? And if you answer yes to all those things, then you have to realize your happiness or your joy is anchored on some extremely shaky circumstances. And that's where anxiety and worry comes in. That's where our challenges come. That's why we can struggle to have joy in the midst of difficult circumstances. And this is why Paul said in this letter, even as we saw here, he doesn't say just rejoice, just be happy, be happy. I was amazed at how many articles talked about that. You just have to choose happiness. Just choose happiness. Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't just say be happy, be happy, just be happy, because that really doesn't help us. He says to find your happiness in the Lord. He says rejoice in the Lord. He gives us the circumstance, or in this case the person, in which we are to anchor our happiness. In fact, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 1611. It simply says this, in your presence, it's speaking of God, it's a psalmist speaking of God. He says, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Notice what he's saying here. He's not saying, I'm going to have joy no matter my circumstances. No, he's saying, this is where the fullness of joy is. It, the circumstance is in the presence of God. He says, in your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You see, the truest and strongest joy is the joy that's been anchored in the person of God. And it's given to us through the person of Jesus Christ. And that can give us infinite joy when we can look forward to those circumstances that are absolutely and certainly ours in Christ. That one day we will be in his presence forever. One day we will enjoy every pleasure that God has in his right hand, meaning just his strength, what he's able to provide. And that's a game changer for us in how we walk through life. So that's what joy is. That's what happiness is. We've, we've seen that. But what often steals our joy? What's the enemy of joy that Paul's going to talk about in this passage so that we can be aware of it and actually fight against it? Paul says this after he says rejoice. He says a couple things, and they don't seem like they're tied together, but you're going to see they all really wrap around this idea of joy and anxiety. He says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. And then he tells us, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Here's what Paul says. Here's what steals our joy. Anxiety and worry. Anxiety and worry that results from worshiping usually the wrong God. It's when we put our hopes in something that doesn't have the strength or stability to support them. It results from anchoring our joy and happiness into what is temporal. And that doesn't mean we can't be happy or find joy in temporal things. It just means we can't anchor our happiness and joy in those things. You can certainly find happiness in your marital relationship. You can find it in the birth of a child, in seeing your kids grow, in having success in your career. There's nothing wrong with having happiness or joy in those temporal circumstances, but if that's your foundation, if they're anchored to that, and that's your deepest hope, people, you can't help 
but face and battle worry and anxiety indefinitely because every single one of those can and one day will be taken away from you. So Paul's trying to help us build perspective in the midst of life, in particular life when it's messy. And he says, don't worry about your life. He says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now he also says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. It seems like this is just kind of thrown in there. It's like Paul saying, hey, rejoice and don't be anxious. Oh, and by the way, you know, you know be gracious. Just seems like a, you know, another statement to throw in here, but there's actually more to it. The word graciousness there also means gentleness. It means meekness. It's a similar word, and it's, and it's exactly in nature in tune with what Jesus said in the Beatitudes when he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So this term Paul uses of gentleness or meekness or graciousness has this idea of, I don't have to exert my power now. I don't have to, to go after grabbing everything I can, you know, in fear that maybe there'll be a lack of this or there, or there won't be other opportunities or someone else might get it for me. Because Jesus says, the blessed are the meek, those who have that mindset that they don't have to find security in this world because we know we're going to inherit the earth. We know the real earth, the lasting earth, the new heavens and earth is already ours. We don't have to cling to something that's going to go away because we know we already have something that's going to last forever. And when Jesus expounds on that beatitude, which in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7, each beatitude is taught by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. So the eight beatitudes, he doesn't just give these eight beatitudes and then go on and preach a bunch of stuff. Each beatitude is actually expounded on or taught about in the Sermon on the Mount. And when he teaches about this principle of meekness, guess what he teaches about? He goes to Matthew chapter 6, and in verse 25, this is part of what Jesus is teaching about when he's talking about meekness or gentleness. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body what you will wear, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Isn't that interesting? And Jesus uses the exact same word here in this passage for worry that Paul uses when he writes to the Philippians. We often don't think of this, that our worry results in us not being gracious. You ever think about that? When you're really anxious, when you're really concerned, when it seems like life's falling apart and things are going haywire, we saw perfect examples of this. Do you remember going to the grocery store just several months ago at the beginning of this pandemic and watching people scrambling to grab toilet paper and bleach or different types of food off the grocery store aisles? They were not gracious at all. Why? because they were filled with anxiety. They were freaking out about what's going to happen in the future and how am I going to walk through this? So worry and anxiety are deeply tied to our character and how we act. And so Paul wasn't just throwing in another characteristic here. He was saying, here's an indicator. Here's a, a the temperature or a thermometer you can take of yourself to see, am I worrying more than I think I am? How gracious am I? How, how much am I trying to change or control my circumstances at the expense of how I'm treating others? And Jesus connects these things together. So how do we address this idea? Paul's saying, don't worry about anything. And he uses the word anything. I know you're saying, hey, Chad, I get that. You know, don't sweat the little things. I realize I got to just brush some things away. But I mean, this upcoming election like, that's something that we need to be concerned about. I mean, there are people that just don't have a clue what's going on. Anything means anything. It even means something that is, is significant as our political leaders and who's put into office, that we do not need to be anxious about that. And by anxious, it means we don't have to be ungracious or ungodly. When we treat others in an ungracious or ungodly way, simply because 
they vote differently than we do, it reveals the fact that we have put more hope in the things of this world and we have anchored our joy and our happiness into this world more than we have into the next. That we aren't rejoicing in the Lord, we're rejoicing in our political climate, we're rejoicing in the things that our nation offers us, which there is nothing wrong with finding temporal happiness and joy in those things, but there is everything wrong with anchoring our joy and happiness to those things, because they're going to come and go. And we need to be challenged as Christians. So anything means anything. It means a political scenario. It means a medical diagnosis. It means a financial crisis. It means a relational crisis. It means a worldwide pandemic. It means anything. Because when we worry, it reveals who we're trusting in. When we worry, it reveals where we have anchored our hope. Now this passage doesn't say don't do anything about these things. It just says don't be anxious about them so that you act in an ungracious or ungodly way. So what am I supposed to do? These are great principles. This is helpful, but what do I actually do? How do I move towards not worrying? How do I move towards joy when I'm in the midst of these seasons? How do I maintain that? And Paul says that in verse 6 as well. He says, don't worry about anything, but... So here he's going to tell us some things we can do. In everything through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, all these words don't need to be explained in intricate detail to get the point. There's really two things that Paul is trying to make clear, and he's just using multiple words to emphasize what we are to do. We're not to take matters into our own hands. We're not to trust in ourselves. He's making it very clear. This is how you avoid worrying about the temporal things in the world. You go to the one who created this world. You go to the one who anchors everything in his mighty hand and his power. You go to God with these issues in prayer. You bring your concerns to him. You don't avoid him. That's a lot of modern, you know, psychology as well that says, hey, tune it out. Just try to tune out all the noise and, and get rid of it. You know, that doesn't do anything. God's saying, no, I want you to think about it. In fact, I want you to think about it so much that you can put it into a specific petition and prayer and take it to me. He cares that much about you. But here's the challenge in here. Here's the transformational thing in this passage. He says, prayer, you know, petition, requests, all that's just bringing these things to God. But he says, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. Here's what I want to challenge you with, because this is what's transformational. I think most of us do pray about the things we worry about. The problem is we walk away from our prayer and we continue to be anxious and worry. And this little word here, this concept, this thought of with thanksgiving, I believe is the key to transformation in this. See, when you can get to the point of thanking God in the midst of your request, when you can get to the point of thanking him because you've recognized what his promises are to you as a believer and what he's capable of, even though you don't have an answer, when you can walk away with a true heart of thankfulness, knowing God is going to do what is ultimately for your best, that's when you finally released your control in this world. You're thankful. Okay, God, you're going to do what you need to do. You see, many of us pray and we bring our concerns to God and then we leave still worrying. And we do that because essentially what we've done is we've just asked God to fix our prayers or fix our worries the way we would want them fixed. But if we're honest, it's our desires oftentimes, it's our way of doing things that's gotten us in the mess we're in in the first place. Why would we want God to bend to our wishes and think that we know the best way to answer 
our prayers. It's no different than a small child if you have children coming to you and asking you to do what they think is best in a given situation when you as a parent know what would be best even before they ask you. Do we really qualify to decide how everything should go down in this world? Do you really want the weight of that on your shoulders? Or would you rather rest and trust in a God who really does see all things and as we learned last week, works all things together for our good? You see, when you pray and you can leave the conversation thankful for God, that his goodness and his assurance and his will will work things out for your good, then you can walk away from that time of prayer with your anxieties cast upon him. Here's something you can't do. You can't walk away truly thankful after your prayers and still worry. Let me say that again. You can't walk away thankful and still worrying. If you're still worrying, then you need to go back to him until you're thankful. Leaving unthankful will always result in ongoing anxiety. This brings us to a great promise that's offered in this passage. And as we look at this last promise in verse 7, I want to examine this promise as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today because I think it really points to what Jesus did for us in the Lord's Supper. So I want to invite Seth, our worship leader, up as we celebrate together. I want to encourage you to grab your elements if you have them at home. If you don't, you can just pretend it's, it's a symbol of Jesus' body and his blood. So go ahead and celebrate with us and do this together as we talk through this. So I'm just going to hold the elements. You can hold them as well tangibly. I wanna, we're going to sing a little bit. We're going to reflect and then a little bit later in the service here, I'm going to lead you through this. So just hold on to them. Hold them as a tangible reminder of who God is and what he's doing in your life. But here's the end of this passage. It's one of our favorites as Christians. Paul says, if we do these things, if we fight for joy, if we fight anxiety and we lean into God and we pray and bring these requests to him and we do so in a way until we're thankful. He says, this is what's going to happen. He says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, if we'll fight for joy, if we'll fight against worry with thankful prayer, then Paul says, this peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul uses a military term, this term guard, to say this is what God's going to do in the person of Jesus Christ. He's going to guard your heart. He's going to guard your mind from these anxieties and worries that you think might happen with a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's not a peace that just says, hey, everything's going to work out the way I want. No, it's a peace that surpasses your understanding and my understanding because it's in God's understanding that's anchored so far above this world. You know, it reminds me of a night in Jesus' life. It was a night right before his betrayal. He'd taken his disciples out into a garden and he was going to pray. He knew what was coming the next day. His disciples were still kind of clueless even though he told them multiple times what was happening. They didn't believe it. But Jesus said, just stay here and pray for me. I'm going to go just a little distance and I'm going to pray myself. And the Bible tells us that Jesus got down and he prayed, said, Father, if there is any, any other way that this can happen, that, that you can bring about your ultimate plan through my life, then please take this cup from me. Jesus says, and a cup was a symbol of the suffering that he was going to face in the hours to come. But then Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. And he, he walks back to his disciples and they've fallen asleep. 
and he urges them again, please pray as I go off and pray. And he goes back, and here's what's interesting. Jesus prays the exact same thing all three times. Like, what's going on here? And the Bible tells us that when he went, he was deeply troubled. He was greatly distressed. These words have such a powerful image of grief and of mourning and of really even anxiety. They can be used in that way. And I think, I'm just guessing, but I think what Jesus was doing is he was showing us what Paul is telling us right here. He was saying, I'm going to keep praying to my God. I'm going to keep bringing my request before him until I can walk away trusting him and being thankful. And the Bible says that that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He wasn't thankful for the cross itself. He was thankful and he anchored his joy in the absolute promise of what he knew was coming on the backside of the cross. It was restoration with his father. He was being restored to his glorious throne. And most of all, why he came to earth, because he had all those things before, was to bring us with him, to invite us, to make it possible for us to experience that same joy. So church, Jesus fought this battle for you. He experienced the true anxiety of honestly separation from his father in a way that poured out his father's wrath upon him and he turned his back upon his son in those moments so that you and I could know for sure no matter what comes our way the father will never turn his back on us Jesus took upon himself what we deserved so that you and I could rest in the hope that only he could have earned, that he could guard in our hearts and our minds. So as you hold these elements, and before we take them, I just want to ask you two things to reflect on as Seth sings a short song over us as we reflect. What is this? Just for the first one. What are you battling? And where are you battling worry and anxiety today? What has got you all tangled up in knots right now? What is that? And then what have you allowed to steal your joy in the Lord? And as we pray, as Seth sings, I want you just to to do what Paul's called us to do. Present these things to the Lord. Fight for your joy and present them until your heart becomes thankful thankful for the battle Jesus fought for you so that you can know without a doubt that your greatest longings and anxieties of acceptance, of provision, you know are complete. You know are enduring and will last forever in Christ. Go ahead and do that now. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you, I owe all to you, Jesus. 
on that night when Jesus was betrayed, he, he took these same elements. And he looked at his disciples that he was with, and he knew it was going to be his last night with them. And he said, uh, this bread, this represents my body. It's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, on that night, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Every time if you drink of it, remember me and my coming. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful. <laughs> We're so thankful for this truth, for the encouragement that you always give us in your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for your honesty that you don't say in this passage that if we just pray uh, and bring our requests that you're going to make life easy for us. That's not what Paul's saying. In fact, Paul's writing this from a prison. What you say is you're going to anchor our joy in something that surpasses our circumstances, that's greater than what we see right here in this life. So come what may, Lord, help us to look past our present temporal life and yes, enjoy the fleeting happinesses and fleeting joys that we can experience in this world that are tied most deeply to you. But Lord, let them not be anchored there. May they be anchored in the unfathomable hope that we have in you, God and the new life, and the new heavens, and the new earth that you have promised for us, and you have secured for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, every time we find ourselves facing anxieties, may we look toward the cross. May we see how Jesus fought, how he guards our hearts by taking what we deserved so that he could offer us what we don't deserve. And Lord, help us know that, that no matter what comes and when death comes, the, the separation, the loss of all joys and happiness in this world that every one of us will face, that that's only the beginning. That you are going to call our name and we are going to rise from that grave and we are going to be in your presence where fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore reside that can never, ever be taken away again. May that be our anchor. May that be our hope. And may we fight for the joy that only those things that you give in your presence will offer us. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a wonderful week.